faster than what I do during the classroom. Um, I will pause after each, uh, pause ever so briefly, just a couple of seconds uh, for you to uh, click the pause button yourself so that you can get down the information you need from each slide. Okay, I, uh, as with the classroom stuff, I will also uh, tell you when things need to be emphasized. Uh, for our avid friends, uh, those emphasized areas can be with an asterisk. Uh, for our non-avid friends, uh, you can also use an asterisk if you want, or you can use uh, any uh, kind of symbol that you wish. Uh, just as long as it helps you uh, know that that material needs to be emphasized because it is information that will, be, uh, that will show up on a quiz or a test. Okay, and remember the asterisk is a little star symbol. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we got scientific revolution. All right, so uh, early science was uh, based mostly on the uh, work, study, and experiments and information brought by our old friend Aristotle from ancient Greece, but also from the Bible. Um, so uh, all the stories, legends about uh, how the world works, uh, the origins of the world, uh, people took that as absolute fact in early science. Um, everything else they had uh, pretty much came from the works of Aristotle. Uh, the Catholic Church was also pretty big into, uh, as far as uh, providing um, early scientific ideas. Um, they were a huge political and educational uh, influence on most people in Europe. Uh, so we had Aristotle, Bible, Catholic Church, all big players as far as educating people. Um, we also had the geocentric theory at the time. Now geocentric means that uh, the entire universe was earth-centered, meaning that everything revolved around the earth. And now this was uh, simply determined by observation. People looked up into the sky, and it looked like things revolved around the Earth. They really didn't know any better. All right? They had no way of measuring things outside of their own field of view. So that's why it seemed like the sun, the moon, the stars, everything viewable in the night sky, or even during the daytime, revolved around them. Then come along new ways of thinking. Uh, so around 1500 CE, um, carrying on what was started with the Renaissance, scholars and academics started to challenge the old ideas of the church. All right, uh, like I was talking about with Renaissance, the church wasn't providing all the answers that these uh, scholars and academics and thinkers were looking for. And so they, uh, they started to write books, they started to write papers, they started to, uh, they used more of their brain power to come up with solutions outside of what the church told them. And so what this did is it started to call into question some of the traditions of the church. And eventually what we got out of it was the scientific revolution, which a, a basic, very good definition is that it's a new way of thinking about the natural world. All right, the natural world also um, encompasses the physical world. Everything that we can physically touch, see, feel, smell, experience, that's all part of the natural world. And uh, a big part of the scientific revolution was that it's coming to your own conclusions that are different from what just simply you are told to think. All right, so people were thinking for themselves. They were uh, looking at new ways to find solutions to problems old and new. Uh, scientific revolution, your definition there, definitely something to emphasize. Now, what are some of the things that caused this uh, scientific revolution? Well, some of it started with the age of exploration, all right? Uh, Europeans getting on their big ships and going out and exploring new lands, all right? They sailed to the coastlines of Africa, Asia, even across the Atlantic Ocean over to the Americas. And uh, the, the new lands that they came to had new things to look at, new things to discover, new people to discover, um, new diseases, unfortunately, to discover, new foods were discovered. All right, so the, the, these uh, um, 
these trips to uh, new places, it opened up all kinds of possibilities of new information, new truths to be found. And uh, so in order to keep this exploration going, more scientific research was needed to continue the voyages, so to speak. All right, so uh, better, uh, better navigation instruments were needed so that they could sail the seas uh, faster and more accurately and ultimately safer. Uh, astronomy and math became huge, using the stars for navigation, but also uh, scientists started to pay more attention to the movements of stars. Was that really a star? Why did one speck of light in the sky behave a little bit differently than another speck of light in the sky? They started to ask those kinds of questions that uh, the church and the Bible and even Aristotle couldn't provide answers to. That's why these new ways of thinking were needed. Mathematics and its use and applications became absolutely important. <clears throat> so these ancient and classical beliefs, they no longer satisfied or provided satisfactory answers or solutions to the questions of the time. All right? So old ways of thinking were out, superstitions were out, critical thinking was in, trying to come up with your own solutions. All right, so we'll come to our uh, first of these uh, great thinkers from the scientific revolution, Nicholas Copernicus. Now he came up with what was known as the, and what still is known as the heliocentric theory. And this is the idea that the planets revolve around the sun, including the earth. Now he did not know how to fully explain how or why this occurred, but based on his observations, he uh, made the conclusion that nothing revolves around the earth well the moon does but he even he didn't fully figure that out till uh, no one figured out that out till later but uh, everything else in in what we know today as our solar system revolves around the sun again he couldn't ex fully explain how or why but his observations told him that something was not right about the geocentric theory that the heliocentric theory was better however that's not what the church taught and the church remember is very powerful and uh, if the church doesn't like it, um, then you better keep your mouth shut, otherwise the church will make trouble for you. So he didn't publish his findings until 1543, uh, just until he died, unfortunately. There's a picture of Copernicus. Uh, yeah, I don't think he probably would have been able to fully explain his hair either. All right, next, Johann Kepler, all right, late 1500s into the early 1600s. Now, he uh, was able to use math and the application of math, its various principles, um, and he was able to come up with new, uh, mathematical laws that govern planetary movements, all right? So he, he knew that mathematical laws did govern or uh, explain uh, how planets move, and then he used math and regular old words to put it into language that regular people could understand. And uh, one of the big important things is that he came up with, uh, or he figured out that planets go in elliptical orbits, not full circles, but more of those uh, oval shapes. Okay, And this time, or, or uh, for this time period, he was able to prove Copernicus right. This time, he was able to provide the explanation for how and why the geocentric theory made sense. And he was able to do it using mathematical expressions. Okay, so Copernicus came up with, ge uh, uh, excuse me, heliocentric theory, um, but Johann Kepler was able to prove it using math. He also built the first model of the universe. And there's Kepler. I don't know what that thing is around his neck. <laughs> All right, Galileo. Now, uh, most of you, or at least a lot of you, have probably heard of Galileo. All right, full name, Galileo Galilei, uh, in Italian, uh, mid-1500s into the uh, early 1600s. So he kind of lived a long time, especially for his time period. Um, now, one of the big things that Galileo was famous for was his telescope. Definitely something to emphasize there. 
all right he didn't invent really the first telescope but he did make a number of improvements on existing telescopes at the time and so he's often credited with uh, inventing the first good telescope if you will um, but with his telescope he was able to observe and uh, gain more information about the planets the move uh, the moon the stars how they moved how they behaved in their orbits now this directly conflicted with the findings that Aristotle came up with thousands of years earlier which meant that it also conflicted with the church's teachings because the church at the time just took on Aristotle's uh, findings because it was already there so the church just agreed with uh, Aristotle which meant that if Galileo um, uh, went against Aristotle's teachings he was also going against the church teachings and the problem there is is that if your information conflicts with the church's information and your information turns out to be right then that could call the church's teachings into question and if the teachings of the church can be questioned tested and even disproved then their authority could be questioned and even uh, their authority could be gone against and the church was not going to have any of that so the church officials they put him on trial and he had to confess that he was wrong all right, they gave him a choice. Confess that you were wrong, say the church is right, or we will kill you. You know, Galileo came to an easy choice, and he said, sorry, I was wrong. Uh, I recant all of, my, uh, all of my findings. Well, of course, he wasn't wrong, and all of his fellow scholars knew that. And so his ideas started to spread anyway. So the church's uh, kind of actions kind of backfired because Galileo's um, Galileo's work started to spread anyway and people started to get wise. And there's Galileo, obviously an older picture from later in life. Now, scientific method. Uh, this is a uh, method uh, a uh, really a way of conducting uh, science uh, making science work for you really that uh, was thought of during the scientific revolution and is still used today all right guys like Copernicus uh, Kepler Galileo they all use the scientific method and they kind of helped to refine it or improve it uh, as the years went on okay and it's basically just a procedure for gathering and testing ideas that's in a nutshell that's really what the scientific method is definitely something to emphasize in your notes now the steps of the scientific method are very simple there's a lot of work involved in all this but the steps at least describing them is simple all right you have a question that you get from or you make up a question based on some observations okay you see something you don't understand you come up with a question about it and then you form a hypothesis so this is kind of like an official version of the question and the hypothesis uh, now has to be tested so you've come up with your idea that you want to see if it's right or if it's wrong um, you test and you collect data and then you analyze or uh, you analyze the data to find out if your original idea was right or if your original idea was wrong if it was right you have basically proven it proven it out now you have to keep proving that out for it to end up really becoming a theory but if you can at least uh, test it out the first time you've taken the uh, the, the big first step towards uh, towards a theory however if your data turns out to be wrong then you have to go through the process all over again change things up and see if there was anything that you missed okay so the scientific method and going through it uh, can be uh, can be a lot of work can be very a uh, uh, lot of steps very painstaking work um, but it's worth it especially if you can prove something right and even if you're not able to prove something right you're still coming up with uh, you're still coming up with other ways to do things okay so using the scientific method is never a loser it's always a winner Now get on to some other uh, famous uh, thinkers that were able to add on to the uh, the scientific knowledge, scientific steps, and really the use of science. All right, Francis Bacon, uh, British guy, uh, mid 1500s through the early 1600s. 
Um, loved science, loved the scientific method. Uh, he also encouraged people to challenge old ways of thinking. He wanted to keep the he wanted to keep the people using their brains. All right, he experimented a lot. Okay, he experimented a lot and he used his uh, data to prove or disprove anything that he could. All right, he believed firmly in what is known as empiricism, or in other words, using the experimental method. All right, you have to get out there and try stuff. You have to learn from your results. Trial and error. If something doesn't work, try something else. If you find out that that doesn't work, try something else. Keep experimenting. Never stop trying to uh, improve your process so that you can eventually come to a new understanding. All right, so uh, Bacon was definitely all about the process. Even if you didn't get any results, as long as you were getting something out of the process. Learn, learn, learn. I'm hoping that he learned to dress better eventually. All right, all you math lovers out there are definitely going to dig on Rene Descartes. All right, French guy, uh, late 1500s through mid 1600s, uh, mathematician. Uh, he was able to link algebra and geometry. So for all you geometry kids out there, um, that are taking geometry, you know how you have to use a lot of algebra in order to figure, uh, figure out some of your geometric problems, like finding you know, measurements of angles and all that stuff, uh, finding unknown quantities. Well, Rene Descartes was one of the big guys who was able to link algebra and geometry to make them both work. Uh, another dude who believed in challenging old ways. Uh, math and logic uh, provided truth for him, not experimentation. Uh, so he was not so, he, he was uh, uh, different from Bacon in that he wasn't a guy to get out there into the world and try this and try that and experiment and process and process and process. No, he was more of a thinker. He stayed inside more, used a lot of math and logic to provide truth. Um, he, uh, if you've ever heard of the famous saying, I think, therefore I am, well, that's Descartes. Okay, he, he felt that everything should be doubted until proven by reason. Everything should be doubted until proven by reason. All right, Isaac Newton, some of you have probably heard of him. Uh, now he, he was one of those guys that stood on the shoulders of giants. And that's uh, that's one of his even famous quotes: is that if he has a, uh, if that he, if he has accomplished great things, it's because he stood on the shoulders of giants. Well, he's being a little modest there. Yes, he did bring in uh, ideas and a lot of work from other thinkers before him, and he used all of that to come up to help him come up with his ideas. But Isaac Newton was no slouch either. All right, so he's definitely being modest with that statement. He made his own uh, very monumental contributions, um, and he, in the end, he was one of those giants himself that he was able to stand on uh, to get uh, big results and make a big impact. Um, he came, uh, now, it's not that he discovered gravity or anything like that. Gravity has always been there, but he provided a way to measure it, and he provided a way to think about gravity in a way that it could then be experimented with. It could be further studied. All right, so he came up with the law of universal gravitation, all right? Uh, gravitational attraction, okay? Um, bigger objects will start to attract other smaller objects around it, okay? Um, mass and distance, so the farther away something is, the effect of gravity is weaker. Um, uh, he, th he looked at the characteristics of the universe uh, as parts of a clock, okay, and they all work very harmoniously in unison in order to make something move or make a number of things move. And uh, just so, and also to make sure that the church got its due, he looked at God as the clockmaker, okay, so he definitely thought, uh, definitely, definitely felt that there was like a higher being kind of controlling everything, but science could still point the way to figure out how everything works.
Okay, other scientific ideas that popped up because of the scientific revolution. Uh, just, uh, uh, just a number of things to mention here. All right, we've got scientific instruments like the microscope, okay, late 1500s. Uh, the microscope then, as it does now, allows for the observation of microbes and bacteria. Uh, uh, this allowed for greater study of these organisms uh, so that we could find out how they worked, uh, why they make people sick, which ones are bad, which ones are good. Okay, a, a lot of those ideas started with observation, and the microscope made that possible. All right, barometer. All right, this is an instrument that measures air pressure. It's used in meteorology or the study of weather. It can be very important, especially since at this time in history, pe the, the vast majority of people are still farmers. Well, if you can get a better idea of what the weather is going to be like, then uh, as you gather data year after year, then you will eventually be able to predict weather patterns. Not really tell the future as far as what's going to happen with weather, but at least find those patterns so that uh, people know how, or at least have a better idea of what to expect from the weather. All right, so microscope, barometer, very important, definitely uh, quiz or test material. Uh, the thermometer as well, okay, able to measure temperature. Um, another uh, useful scientific tool for uh, working with weather, but also eventually, hey, whenever you go to the doctor and they run that thing across your forehead, well, it all started with the simple thermometers back in the early 1700s. All right, uh, medicine, moving on to medicine. All right, the, uh, the idea of taking corpses, people, uh, the bodies of people who have died, and cutting them open so that uh, uh, doctors and scientists could find out what made the human body tick. All right, why did people get sick one way or another way? What did these sicknesses do to the insides of people? Okay, how did, um, um, how did you know, heart disease, things like that. Uh, what happens to lungs, what happens to livers? All right, the, the, this was kind of like the, uh, the beginning of modern medicine, if you will. <clears throat> And these observations, these studies, these experiments, they led to various kinds of inoculations and vaccine, uh, vaccines. Um, out of uh, the scientific revolution came eventually, not right away, but eventually, um, a cure for smallpox. All right, so these studies were able to wipe out smallpox, which was one of the big killers of humanity for centuries and centuries all across the world. Uh, it also these uh, studies also later led to vaccines to combat uh, different kinds of illnesses. All right, so super important stuff that came out of the scientific revolution, and it all came from observations and testing and thinking and coming up with solutions, never giving up, always using the process to try to come to new conclusions. All right, so what were the legacies of the scientific revolution? All right, lots of use of reason, experimentation. Okay, this use of reason and experimentation wasn't just good for science. It could spread out to all different ways of life and all, all through different fields of life. Okay, the scientific revolution could lead to, uh, would eventually lead to better harvests out on the farm, would lead to new ways of thinking about government, would lead to new ways of making weapons. Okay, so science definitely has uh, uh, effects on all different parts of life. Scientific revolution was a, um, was a time period in which science really started to flourish and reach out even further into different parts of life. All right, scholars began to challenge other ways of thinking all over the place. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, this questioning and this challenging of old superstitions, old ways, even the ways of the church, this had big, huge changes, big impact on lots of different aspects of life. And uh, as we get into the uh, Enlightenment um, next week, um, we'll see how Enlightenment thinkers started to take the uh, the beginnings of the scientific revolution and what the scientific uh, scientific revolution brought and it applied those principles it, it applied stuff like the scientific method to human interaction how could science be used to study people societies how they interact how they interact with their government why the government interacts this way with the people all right so the enlightenment uh, in a big way will take the scientific method and start applying it to human societies. 
All right, so uh, when you guys are uh, done getting your information here, uh, make sure you go back, um, review those notes, all right, make those questions, make those summaries. For our AVID friends, make sure that you're showing your evidence of repetition, your underlining, your highlighting, your circling. Don't forget your asterisks next to stuff that should be emphasized. Um, our non-AVID friends even, highlighting is still a great way to uh, emphasize things. Uh, make sure you're uh, providing enough space in between ideas so that they don't blend in together. And uh, again, don't forget to do those questions and those summaries. They are an important part of the review process so that you get the most out of your notes. Okay, so this uh, concludes Scientific Revolution. I will uh, see you guys for the next one. Take care.